Welcome to the first of our PH25 series of videos where we're celebrating our 25th anniversary by asking you to vote for the very best cars of the last 25 years. Kind of makes sense when you think about it. And what better way to kick things off than this, the Lotus Elise. <laughs> This is the car that won your vote for the best sports car of the last 25 years. And it didn't win just by a little bit, it won by an absolute country mile. Well, of course it did. It's a brilliant car. But the other thing that's nice about the Lotus Elise is it was in production for 25 years and it only went out of production in 2021. So if you think about it, its history has worked pretty much continuously with our own. What can I tell you about this car that you don't already know? Probably nothing, because let's face it, ever since it was launched in 1996, it's had every superlative and every lyrical waxing bestowed upon it. Of course it has, and also the fact that the Elise is part of the Lotus legend, the car that saved Lotus and all that. Right then, it all started in 1994, when Lotus was living on its wits and the thinnest of cash reserves. And a big part of its financial black hole this time was a massive missed opportunity with its last attempt at an entry-level sports car, the Elan. And no, not the 60s one, but the M100, the front-wheel drive one with the Isuzu engine that came out in 1989. The thing is, the M100 wasn't a bad car. It was pretty and Lotus is said to have spent an unprecedented £37 million developing it. And when it arrived, the press wrote great things about how it went down the road, but it never really lit the fires in the hearts of buyers and failed to do the numbers that Lotus had hoped for. And why was that? Well, partly because the Elan was wrong-wheel drive, but also because of Mazda. Now, Mazda had bought out this little rival called the MX-5, which was a proper rear-wheel drive sports car and seen as the true successor to the original Elan. In fact, I think it was so good, Mazda ended up selling quite a few of those over the years. So when work started on the Elan's replacement, Lotus went back to the drawing board, back to its roots and bring out something that followed Chapman's mantra of simplify, then add lightness. So Lotus's chief engineer, Richard Rackham, developed the Elise around a lightweight, extruded and bonded aluminium chassis with this fiberglass body on top. And that kept the weight down to just 725 kilograms, which was really a minuscule amount, even in the 90s. But at the same time, the tub was stiff, so that was the perfect platform for the suspension to work from. And also, this pioneering process kept production costs down, which means that when the Elise was first shown at the Frankfurt Motor Show in 1995, it was priced at just 18,995. The fiberglass body was designed by a man called Julian Thompson, whose love of the Ferrari Dino inspired the Series 1 shape. And you can see that very clearly, with the influence from the Dino showing in the form of the front wings and the cooling ducts running through the doors to the rear wings, and also in the curved windscreen that wraps around you when you sat behind the steering wheel. Meanwhile, the name comes from another legendary car maker. At the time, Lotus was owned by Bugatti, and the boss, Romano Artioli, famously used his two-year-old granddaughter, Elisa, as his inspiration to christen it. And that, in a nutshell, is the story of how the Elise was born. So the engine was the 1.8 litre K-series engine bought in from Rover. And at the car's launch, that had 120 horsepower. But that was fine because with so little weight to push down the road, it would still do 0 to 60 in about five and a half seconds. However, the car we've got today, which has been kindly lent to us by a good PHer, is the car that came later in 1999, the Elise 111S. And that had the same 1.8 litre capacity, same K-series engine, but it came with VVC, variable valve control. That flattened out the torque curve, gave you more low-end torque and more mid-range, but also pushed the peak power to 145 horsepower. And to make use of all that extra oomph, the 111S also came with a lovely close ratio five-speed gearbox, plus wider rear tires. And 145 horsepower, doesn't necessarily sound a lot by modern standards, but it really is more than enough in this, because this isn't a car for straight roads. The Elise is a car, it needs corners to shine. And that's why we've come to the foothills of Snowdonia, not just for the dramatic scenery, which is a cinematographer's delight, maybe not on a day like today when it's very misty and wet, but because these are the kind of roads that the Elise was born for tight and twisting with cameras and crests thrown in. The sort of stuff that brings out the very best in a car designed by a company with the Midas touch when it comes to chassis design. 
And that means this car is such a joy, even at sensible speeds. I'm just doing 50 miles an hour now, and yet with the fizz and the vibrancy that the Elise elicits, I could be doing twice that in a hypercar, not touching the sides and having nowhere near as much fun. And it brings out the joy in cars again for me. To drive a car like this, something where you can be bouncing off the rev limiter and just listening as the tire tread blocks squeal across the road. Maybe not on a day like today, admittedly, especially in an owner's car that I'm trying to be very careful of because we've been so kindly lent. But you know, when it's your car and all you've got is a fantastic road in front of you and you can just enjoy ragging a car, taking it to the very edges. Whereas when a car's got too much grip and too much power, you just can't get anywhere near that. And then there's that little K-series engine behind me. Now, it might not be the most evocative engine ever, and it might not be the most evocative engine Lotus ever produced. And I'm thinking of things like the twin cam, but it's still a part of the car. It's still a part of the experience because even though it's only got 145 horsepower, because there's so little mass to move, it's just so responsive. It's like it's, look at that. It's like it's in the starting blocks, waiting all the time for the minute you press the accelerator and then boof, it's off. It just responds straight away. But you do sort of need to treat it a little bit like a supercar though, because you may have heard the K-Series tendency to mud through head gaskets. Well, that's why with a Lease, you need to make sure it's all warm through before you start booting it, get everything up to temperature. But then once you do give it the beans and give it a bit of welly, it's not slow, it really isn't, especially when you get it at the upper reaches of the rev range like that. So once you get into 5,000 or so, it just pulls really hard and it pulls all the way to the red line as well. And all the while, I've got that Apart from the Jan Speed exhaust, which is an option fitted to this car from the factory. And also that lovely kind of induction roar, I can hear it sucking away behind me. And there's nothing better than hearing a car breathing because it makes you feel like it's a, an actual living, breathing thing. And because the Elise is such a featherweight, it's like a, I don't know, like a featherweight fighter in Benz. It's, just so nimble and eager. It's like it's up on its toes all the time, ready to dart this way and that, and take on the challenges, any challenge that the B road can throw at it. But at the same time, it's not all tensed up like this. It's got its relaxed side too, because the suspension's really nice and supple. So that as you're going along like this, you're not being bounced around, or you don't feel like it's gonna skip here and there. It's kind of, working with you. It really is just a fantastically engineered and beautifully designed car. Look at that through there, lovely kind of positive camber bend there. You just feel the forces load up in the car, feel it through the steering. And then talking about the steering, I haven't got to that bit yet, have I? Of course, wonderfully unassisted, completely pure steering. There's no electrics or hydraulics to absorb any of the little surface sensations coming up through the steering wheel. This lovely little three-spoke leather steering wheel. It's just mapping out the road surface for me, transmitting every bit of information I need. So every surface change becomes like a sensory experience. It's not just the steering that's unassisted, of course. The brakes are unassisted too. There's no servo. Here, this is more like a proper little Formula racing car setup. It's all about connecting you a little bit more deeply to the road and the experience, so that every time you come up to a bend, every time you put your foot on the brake, you've got this lovely solid pedal that you can interact with, and it helps you know exactly when the wheels are about to start under rotating, and then you can just ease the pedal pressure very, very slightly and stop the lockup and keep the wheels rotating and you're gripping. It's a proper driver's car. That's what this car is. Proper little driver's car. The other amazing thing is that I can fit in it. I mean, it's not a big car, the Elise, but I've got actually more than enough room to operate everything perfectly. Steering wheel's where I need it to be. 
lovely little pedal box, those lovely aluminium pedals, just almost like a work of art really when you see them. And everything I need is right where I need it to be. And everything I don't need, well it ain't here. I've just got a heater, got a rev counter, got a speedometer, some light switches, and that's about it. But with all that said, I don't want to give you the impression that an Elise is an easy car to drive, because it's not. In fact, I was talking to a mate of mine, Pete, who used to work for one of the other big motoring magazines back in the day when the Elise was launched. And he was telling me a story, he goes, if you go back to the mid 90s, there'll be a cover on this said magazine of an Elise fully on the lock stops. And he said, that wasn't me doing some heroic power oversteer. He said, that was me lifting off into a corner and having an armful of lift off oversteer, which scared the bloody life out of me. And he said, the thing is, the guys at Lotus, the engineers, he said, they all know how to drive. And he doesn't mince his words, Pete. He goes, yeah, they all know how to drive. They all know how to set up a car. And as far as they're concerned, if you can't live with that, you can f off. And I kind of tend to agree with him about that because it's good to have a car that keeps you on your toes, keeps you on edge a little bit, but then rewards when you get it all so very right. And that's what the Elise does. It really just rewards you fantastically for all the stuff you put in, all the work you put in. It's a proper driver's car, the Elise, and that's of course why it's one of our PH25 sports car category and you couldn't have a more deserving winner in my book. So that's the first in our series of PH25 videos where we're celebrating our 25th anniversary and of course the great cars that have appeared in that time. And don't forget to keep an eye out on pistonheads.com for the next category of car we'll be asking our readers to vote on. Of course, do give this video a like if you liked it. And if you want to be notified whenever we post a new video, hit subscribe now and turn on notifications.